threats to the natural world are multiplying. Species are going extinct at an alarming rate. Unless we move quickly to protect global biodiversity, we will soon lose most of the species composing life on Earth. But there's a solution. It's called Half Earth. If we can serve half the land and sea, we can still safeguard the bulk of our planet's biodiversity. But what would Half Earth look like? How do we get there? By mapping our planet's biodiversity in fine detail, and in relation to human activities, we can pinpoint the best places to conserve the maximum number of species. Mindful of our ever-changing world, we can identify wildlife corridors and other management solutions that can help sustain biodiversity. With the right information to guide effective conservation efforts, we have the opportunity to support the most biodiverse places in the world, as well as the people who call these paradises home. The Half Earth Project is working to engage people everywhere in why these places are special and how they can best be managed to protect life on Earth. Through cutting-edge technology, we're mapping the magnificent global web of biodiversity with unprecedented resolution and providing scientific leadership and actionable guidance for conservation to achieve the goal of Half Earth. We can share this precious planet of ours. All life can prosper. It would be humanity's greatest achievement. save half the earth? Yes, we can if we want to. Good evening and welcome. I'm Paul Alavisados, the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost, and I'm really deeply honored and frankly thrilled and curious uh, to be here this evening to act as your MC. Um, I think uh, I can stand a little bit as a proxy. I'm a faculty member in chemistry. I do research in nanoscience, and like I think hundreds of faculty, many, many thousands of students and many friends uh, and staff on the Berkeley campus, I'd like to be able to contribute to what the future of our planet will be like. Uh, but to do that from my own vantage point, um, I feel I really need some kind of overarching context, some way of thinking about the overall problems that we face in the topic of environment, energy, biodiversity. And so uh, tonight's event, uh, I think, will be just phenomenally important for so many of us to learn about how can we think about um, the greatest challenges that, that we face. Uh, we will be inspired tonight uh, by the renowned biologist and naturalist uh, Edward O. Wilson, who has been a leading voice in uh, this whole field for over 60 years. Um, <laughs> He has expressed a vision and call to action to conserve half the Earth's land and sea to provide sufficient habitat to safeguard the biodiversity of this planet, including ourselves. His, um, he and the Half Earth Project are bringing this grand ambition to life. Earlier today, 
half-Earth conference participants really engaged in a deep give and take around the science and technology with members from many people, many uh, colleagues from around the world coming uh, to uh, participate in that uh, wonderful event. There were people from nonprofit sectors, government, education, and the private sector all coming together to think about this enormous challenge uh, under the context of this powerful guiding framework. We're going to have a spectacular program tonight, but before we begin the formal program, we have um, an unexpected but very special guest to welcome you. Please welcome the 34th and 39th Governor of California, Jerry Brown. Thank you. I, I take that as cheering for the ecosystem of which I am a proud member. Because it's not us against the environment, but it's us in the environment, part of the environment. And as one goes, so goes the other. And that's what we're here tonight to talk about. We have a lot of issues. Certainly, I can tell you in the political world, there's lots of concern about housing and homeless and health care and, and uh, all sorts of things, not to mention all those strange people in Washington. <laughs> but leaving that, and that's really important, that's really big. But what's even bigger and more profound and all encompassing is the web of life of which we are a very small part, but a part that is so powerful that some say we're bringing about the sixth extinction. That really is our business right now. It's not just progress, it's not just power, it's not just wealth, it's extinction. And we've gotta find a way to get on the side of nature instead of just fighting it. And E.O. Wilson has given us a pretty simple idea. Let's leave half the earth for everybody else for whom we depend. And the arrogance of the human being, the arrogance that has led to all the greatness can also lead to the utter destruction. In fact, it is. In fact, we don't need to wait for the sixth extinction. We have thousands of nuclear warheads. We've got 7,000 at least. Russia has 7,000. And they're on 30-minute alert. In a few minutes, it could all be over. Poof. Now, I hope that those characters in Washington and in Moscow chill and give us a little time to work on the other extinction, which we still have some time to stop. We can't stop at all, but we can slow it down and ultimately get to a point where we can save, according to uh, Professor Wilson, 85% of the species. And in California, we are making the maps, we're doing the research, we are, you are, the university is in the lead, uh, principally right here, but also the other universities. And we're identifying the plants, the, the insects, the animals, the fauna, the flora. It's so important that we get acquainted with our home. And you'd never know how important it is by looking at your cell phone, listening to the radio, television, your iPhone. There's so much noise that we don't even see too often uh, what we're standing on, where we are, and what we are a part of. So tonight, you're going to hear about, uh, you're going to hear about all this from the guy who's really pioneered and has been the visionary to wake us up to who we are, where we are, and what the stakes are. And the stakes are, can we reorient this civilization so it's not just based on uh, hamburgers and uh, electric cars and hospitals and housing and symphonies, but also on our uh, deep reverence and connection to all living things. And that's what we're here tonight to talk about, to understand and ultimately to protect and to keep half the land. Now, keeping half the land for the other people is really hard, really hard, because they don't have lobbyists, they don't have the powerful people, they don't got no money, they don't have any degrees. So somehow we have to be the stewards to protect the other half. 
the half that will sustain us. Because we don't know when is the species that dies and goes extinct, then we go with it, like the canary in the coal mine. That's where we are. Tonight we're going to learn a little more. So thank you very much. Hold on to your hat. We're on a rough ride here through uh, planetary space. And please, let's keep it going for a few more millennia. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Brown. Now on to tonight's program, which is a discussion of nothing less than how to save the natural world. Tonight, Dr. Stephen Lockhart will introduce the problem, the crisis that we are facing. Then Dr. Walter Yetz will present the science behind the solution featuring the Half-Earth Project map, using integrated layers of high-resolution data to identify those places where we have the best opportunity to protect the most species. Tonight's lecture, Half-Earth, How to Save the Natural World, is sponsored by the Berkeley College of Natural Resources. It's an amazing college, and uh, we are all so grateful to have uh, our colleagues from CNR uh, to teach us. Uh, but the lecture is specifically sponsored by the Horace M. Albright Lecture in Conservation and the James M. and Catherine D. Stone Foundation Distinguished Lectureship in Biodiversity. We are just deeply grateful to these long-term supporters of the lectureships for making tonight's special program possible. So let me take a moment now to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Stephen Lockhart. He is the Chief Medical Officer for Sutter Health. That's a not-for-profit system of hospitals, physician organizations, and research institutions in Northern California. He is a Rhodes Scholar. He obtained his master's degree in economics from Oxford University and MD and PhD degrees from Cornell. He's an avid climber and backpacker. He has a long-standing pa passion for providing environmental science education and introducing our national parks to an increasingly diverse population. He serves on the boards of the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, Nature Bridge, and National Parks Conservation Association, as well as REI. He was previously a member of the National Parks Second Century Commission, which in 2009 truly laid a foundation for thinking about uh, the next uh, chapter in the lives of our national parks. So uh, Steve, welcome. We're so grateful to have you. Good evening. <laughs> well, I was supposed to talk about the problem, so here I am. <laughs> we uh, fixed the problem, but that's not the problem we're here to talk about. Change, one word, one syllable, but it's a powerful, powerful word. On the one hand, change can evoke a sense of fear and anxiety. On the other, change can open the door for a brighter, more sustainable future. Change, one word, an important word, that we're gonna talk a lot about tonight. Now, as a kid growing up in the 1960s, we had a lot of change. We had the Vietnam War, we had the Civil Rights Movement, and we suffered through the assassinations of John and Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. And we had the space race. That was a lot of change. Now, when you're young, you want to see the world. I know that I did. And I thought the best way to do that would be to become an astronaut and see the world from space. But 
At that time, a young black kid from St. Louis like me with the prevailing sentiments around race, that just wasn't going to happen. So I found another way to see the world, the natural world, and that was by joining the Boy Scouts. My uncle was a troop leader of our segregated troop, and he took us outdoors. And that was invigorating, that was exciting, and it was liberating, because all of those societal strictures and constraints just didn't exist in the out of doors. And that created in me an abiding love for the natural world and a fierce determination to protect the Earth's natural resources. And in my opinion, the future of our planet depends upon us instilling that same abiding love and fierce determination in every member of the next generation. Now this thinking, <laughs> this thinking led me to join an organization about 20 years ago, the board of an organization called Nature Bridge, because their mission is to create the next generation of environmental stewards by educating them in national parks. And part of being a board member, of course, is that you meet other board members. And one of the board members I met was a founding member of the organization, a fellow named Bill Anders. Now, if you're not going to become an astronaut, and I never did, the next best thing is to befriend one. <laughs> it's true. And Bill was an Apollo 8 astronaut, who along with Frank Borman and Jim Lovell were the first to orbit the moon in 1968. And he took along with him a camera, and he took a photo. And I know that every one of you has seen this photograph because it is the most iconic photo of the 20th century. Earthrise. Now, as recounted to me by Bill, when he saw this, two things happened. First, he said, Jim, give me the camera, quick, hurry up, color film, let's go, come on. The second thing he said was, wow, look at that. Wow, look at that. Now, if you know these guys, they are the caricature of the right stuff, right out of the movies. Cool, calm, collected in their DNA. Nothing phases them, but this, this blew their minds. Frank said, when we peered out of that little window into the depths and darkness of space, the only thing we saw with any color on it was the Earth. And it was at that moment that we understood just how fragile our planet is and the responsibility that we all have to protect it. And he went on further to say that once we saw the Earth, we lost all interest in the moon. They went to the moon to discover the Earth. That's true. And when this photo came back and went around the world on the cover of Time magazine, it created a moral imperative to care for creation, to care for the planet and for its people. And the health of the planet and the health of the people are inextricably linked. This fact was first identified by the esteemed Dr. Ed Wilson, whom we're going to hear from later this evening in his concept of biophilia which essentially says that we as human beings have an innate affinity for other living things, the natural world. It's who we are. And this is what it looks like. These are some kids on a Nature Bridge program in Olympic Park amongst the trees. But look at their faces. You see a sense of calm, even a sense of awe. And awe is an actual thing. I didn't know that before. It's a thing. Because Dr. Dachner Keltner right here at UC Berkeley is a social psychologist who studies the science of awe. And he finds that awe occurs not exclusively, but often in, in nature. And it's what you feel when you're in the presence of something greater than yourself. And when we're experiencing awe, we are kinder, we are gentler, we are better versions of ourselves. And there's also physiologic impacts. Stress hormones are reduced, blood pressure and heart rate is lowered. And this is so profound that in 1982, the Japanese created a program called Shinrin Ryoku, or forest bathing, which was a public health exercise to get people out among the trees. But what happens when this linkage is severed, forgotten, or lost? We get change, climate change. Now, warming of the earth is indisputable, and human impacts are clear. Greenhouse gases are at the highest level in human history causing issues for both human and natural systems. 
Some of the impacts we've seen, even since 1950, have been the greatest that we've seen in decades, and in other instances, the greatest we've seen in millennia. The atmosphere and oceans are warming. Snow and ice is melting, and sea levels are rising. Now, carbon dioxide levels at the end of the last century, about 1900, were at about 280 parts per million in the atmosphere. And they've raised now to the level of 400 parts per million with an attendant rise in global mean temperature. And although the global mean temperature of the Earth's surface has warmed by one degree, temperatures across the lands have warmed even further by a degree and a half, which means we can expect further heat-related events like heat waves, drought, desertification, wildfires, and also more heavy precipitation events. Oceans are absorbing carbon dioxide, becoming more acidic. Our oceans are now 26% more acidic than they were in the industrial age. Sea ice is disappearing at a rate of 4% per decade, and sea levels have risen almost eight inches in the last century, more than in the last two millennia. Now, climate change is a force multiplier for our human impact on the planet. Biodiversity, the diversity within species, the diversity among species, and among ecosystems is declining at the fastest rate in history. Humans have impacted 75% of our land surfaces, 66% of our ocean area, and 85% of our wetlands. And although forest loss has slowed since 2000, the impact is not uniformly distributed because some of the greatest losses are occurring in our tropical and subtropical areas with the greatest biodiversity. Coral, half of our coral, live coral, has been lost since the 1870s and continues to be lost due to ocean acidification. And up to 25% of our animal and plant species can legitimately claim to be threatened with extinction. Now, the impacts of climate change on human health and well-being are numerous. They include direct impacts like fire and flood. The photo here of the fire is from a recent wildfire in Santa Rosa, during which time both our Sutter Health and colleagues at Kaiser Permanente had to evacuate our hospitals. One of our Sutter hospitals in Lake County has been evacuated three times due to wildfires. The photo below showing floods. The International Organization on Migration estimates that by 2050, we will have between 25 and 200 million environmental refugees. And health impacts of climate change are mediated through natural systems as well, such as air quality and vectors. Air pollution kills seven million people a year, more than twice those who die from AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. And vector-borne diseases like Zika virus have now expanded their geographical footprint because of warming. We are in a period of change, immense change, climate change, and we have a choice. We can either go the path of fear and anxiety, or we can open the door to a bright and more sustainable future. I, for one, advocate the latter. In a period of change and uncertainty, it is important that we all take personal responsibility, that we take the mantle of leadership to make sure that our actions are not just consistent with, but are role models of caring for creation, the planet, and its people. Margaret Mead said it best, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lockhart. It's my pleasure now to welcome Dr. Walter Yetz. He is Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and Adjunct Professor in the School of Forestry and Environment at Yale University. He is Scientific Chair 
of the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation and the lead scientist for the Half Earth Project Map. He led the science track at Half Earth Day today. Walter is director of the Yale Center for Biodiversity and Global Change, which links scientists, students, and practitioners engaged in the environmental, biological, policy, or health aspects and implications of global biodiversity change. He also leads the Map of Life, how cool is that, um, which consolidates global biodiversity distribution data sources into a single asset to provide the best possible species range information and species list for any geographic area worldwide. Welcome, Walter. Good evening. There are many reasons to conserve, to carefully look after landscapes worldwide. We've heard just earlier how we humans have an innate connection, an innate innate pleasure that we're getting, obviously, around uh, being in these amazing landscapes. Some of the most amazing ones among them, actually, here in, in California. Many, many reasons, cultural, spiritual values, uh, more mundane, carbon sequestration, recreation, as well as uh, just the need to maintain and sustain the last wild places for future generations. But I would argue that species are the absolute key in all of this. There are the critical elements underpinning the ecosystems that constitute these landscapes. They're the nodes on this very intricate, intricate web of life that's ultimately behind nature's benefits to people. And actually, in some of the, the most intriguing discussions today, we, we were told and got a nod from the audience that this is not just about ourselves right now. It's really for the future generations that we need to sustain biodiversity, that we need to ensure that future generations will have these benefits that in some cases we're not even aware of uh, at this point, actually in most cases. Now, as populations decline worldwide, and we read about it in the newspapers and North American birds, for example, just recently, it's just, uh, a very dire situation and uh, one that we need to be incredibly concerned about. But I would argue that nothing, nothing at all, is more troubling than losing species for forever. Looking at these examples here, the one at the bottom, the oil bird, has been separated from its closest living relative for over 70 million years. It's a, a key seed disperser in South America, carrying seeds in a single night up to 200 kilometers. And it's actually, if you were to lose that species altogether, you'd probably see a change in the structure of the forests there. So each one of these species serves a really fundamental role. How, do we can, how can we then put species into this landscape or landscape conservation equation? And this is where Ed Wilson's pioneering work actually comes into play. Back in the 60s, um, he pioneered the theory of island biogeography together with uh, Robert McArthur. And it offered uh, an almost transformational principle to go from species to conservation planning um, in, a, in a geographic context. So bear with me for a moment. This is how this started out. It's simply from the observation that as you roam around the Caribbean um, and identify lizards in all these islands, you obviously realize that more species are found on larger islands. And others then took that principle further and applied it to habitat fragments. So uh, islands of habitats uh, arising through encroachment. And here, again, we find that smaller and smaller fragments hold fewer species. And you can flip this around and essentially make it a dynamic principle around habitat loss leading to species uh, loss, species reduction. And, and it's somewhere in the middle there that you could argue and, and you could think of these original equations and put them into the picture here and say, well, we really wouldn't want to go 
beyond that point there, beyond, beyond say, nine, we, wanna, we wouldn't want to lose more than 10% of species. And that is what brings us to this half. That's half the area lost. And I'm, I'm saying this because this is, if you will, the guiding principle behind uh, half Earth, the half Earth project, and what he, Ed is talking about and so eloquently in his book, Half Earth. And that's what's bringing us together tonight. And science has moved uh, quite a bit since the 60s, and we are now in an, uh, able to think about not just species richness or this aggregate number of species as a whole, but we're able to think about the similar sort of principles, species by species. So what is that curve, species by species, and how uh, does land cover change and climate change ultimately affect their survival, and what can we do against that? Uh, how can we uh, sustain species going forward, for example, through reserves or other sort of conservation management? So this is where the really tricky science comes in, and uh, that's where we see our role uh, to deliver the science and information to ensure that species are at least not unknowingly left behind. There's no question, well, there will have to be triage. We can't save every species from extinction. However, at least we want to do it in an informed way. And that's where I see our work, the science work in the half F project and the people engaging around it, the scientific community that we're engaging this conversation uh, come into play. Deliver the science, the R&D, if you will, for effective conservation decision making. And that's where this species is coming in, in a critical way, the California thrasher. I hope many of you had, this, had the chance to see this species. It's not just uh, an amazingly, uh, it's, it's quite a character of a species if you see it in nature. Uh, it's got this uh, kind of uh, quite uh, a dominant beak and a uh, very agile manner about it. It's uh, also a really important element of the chaparral communities around here in, in, in California. It's an important node in that food web, and uh, um, it's uh, also an indicator of, of a healthy chaparral. So I encourage you to find it and think about it, not just as an important species, but also as one that's intrigued scientists such as Joseph Grinnell at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology here at Berkeley about 100 years ago. And he came up with this principle of connecting uh, species habitat associations or environmental associations with where they are then found on the map. And it, it was an absolutely empowering principle, I would say almost as much as island biogeography, that's now gaining new importance, for example, through the availability of high resolution remote sensing data. We have detailed maps of the planet, uh, not just static maps, dynamic maps that allow us to monitor change. And we have an increasing amount of new data sources also for biodiversity, citizen science observations, camera traps, GPS tracking data. So there's an immense amount of data coming through that we can then use in this uh, same way in, in which Grinnell thought about learning about species environmental needs. You can take this data, link it up to the remote sensing inf information, think about a multivariate niche that characterizes a species, and then put that back into a geographic space. And that's what we're doing uh, increasingly at scale in, in Map of Life, where we're able to go from relatively limited information, such as these expert, uh, uh, green expert blobs, or relatively limited and often biased, roadside bias, we call that, uh, point data from citizen science observations, for example, to something that then integrates these pieces and gets us to something that actually is, has a spatial resolution that can be actionable on the ground. It's this red, more detailed map you see in the background there. And it's integrating these two pieces of information and realizing that the experts aren't always right and the points aren't uh, always where they should be. And we're now getting to something that can be a scientific basis for conservation decision making. And we've been able to scale this up, uh, at least in a, in a coarse way, to uh, almost 40,000 species to identify um, in a comparable way the most important places for additional conservation action in the world. So these are not maps of richness, these are maps of uh, importance sort of in a complementarity uh, context of particular places. And actually California, um, you wouldn't be surprised, uh, shows up here as, as quite an important location. And through the Half Earth map, we are then able to put this in, a, in an engaging visual way online. I encourage you to check it out at, uh, at the Half Earth website. And we're able to not just map the uh, encroachment or protection in great detail, but increasingly also the species that would be triggering a place that's showing up 
uh, as important. And we can look at a whole range of species here that are of global significance, for which this region of, of central Southern California holds uh, globally, global stewardship uh, for a whole range of species and, and start a, conservation around, a conversation around them. For example, the Herman's a kangaroo rat that still has a rather limited evidence base to then actually drive forward particular conservation action. And in California, we are in a really special place for that. Um, an immense number of species, an immense portion of those species um, of uh, endemic restricted to that place. And we had a, a wonderful uh, conversation today around the biodiversity in California over 1,600 plant species restricted, uh, over dozens and dozens of mammals, birds, amphibians uh, restricted to California. California holds the sole stewardship for these species. And then it holds partial stewardship for a lot of other species that it shares with Nevada or Arizona. So that's the sort of global information, global context that we're able to bring in through activities such as the Half Earth uh, Global Mapping. So we talked about these cases today uh, in our conversations with the California panel and uh, the data, the evidence base, as well as the science um, came out as leading here for California, unsurprisingly. We had important conversations around the importance of bringing people, uh, social issues, uh, working landscapes into this conversation, as well as uh, adaptive, climate adaptive uh, uh, conservation approaches. It was uh, almost a goosebump inducing to then have um, people such as Wade Crawford and Chuck Bonham uh, on the panel to reflect on some of these uh, speeches that we heard from the scientists and give their response and their uh, forward-looking vision as to how Californian, California could go forward in uh, uh, practical uh, conservation. And uh, again, California is a leading example for conservation policy and action and actually holding almost a global responsibility and being able to carry this to other places potentially in a half-earth context. And there was the call for actionable scientific information of the sort that, for example, is done here at Berkeley. So this, again, is not a richness map of the plants of California. It's the places uh, that are gaps at this point. Thousands of species were analyzed and modeled in great detail of the, in the way I was talking about earlier. And these are the current conservation gaps and a tremendous amount of outstanding conservation already done at California. In some ways, over half of California already conserved. However, there are important gaps. And uh, here are just some of them. And I want to finish on a, on, a, on a really optimist and, and positive note, because uh, that one over here, and we have the, the very person in the audience today, uh, is, uh, for example, now conserved. Uh, Jack and Laura Dengamon Preserve. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Thank you, Walter. Now the conversation everyone has been waiting for. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Edward O. Wilson and Sally Jewell to the stage. Sally Jewell is a longtime friend and advocate for the environment who brings expertise to this topic from the business world, federal government, and non-governmental organizational leadership. She has previously served as the U.S. Secretary of the Interior from 2013 to 2017 in the Obama administration. During, during her tenure, she was recognized for using a science-based landscape level, collaborative approach to natural resources management. Her work, her work included championing the importance of science and sharing data to better understand the Earth's systems, encouraging investments for more sustainable use of water in the West, deepening relationships with indigenous communities, and long-term conservation of the nation's most vulnerable and irreplaceable natural, cultural, and historic treasures. <laughs> Sally Jewell, 
previously served as president and CEO of REI, the $2.6 billion member-owned cooperative dedicated to facilitating outdoor adventures. She has served as a regent of the University of Washington and distinguished fellow in the College of the Environment at the University of Washington. And she will know no rest. She currently serves as interim chief executive officer for the Nature Conservancy. Thank you, Sally, for all of the amazing work that you do and for leading the discussion this evening. Now it brings me great pleasure to introduce Edward Osborne Wilson, generally recognized as one of the leading scientists in the world. E.O. Wilson, e. o. Wilson is one of the foremost naturalists in both science and literature, a synthesizer of ideas with works stretching from pure biology across to the social sciences and humanities. He is acknowledged as the creator of two scientific disciplines, island biogeography and sociobiology. Three unifying concepts for science and the humanities jointly, biophilia, biodiversity studies, and consilience, and one major technological advance in the study of global biodiversity, the Encyclopedia of Life. E.O. Wilson has received more than 100 awards, including the U.S. National Medal of Science, the Crawford Prize, which is equivalent of the Nobel for Ecology, the International Prize for Biology of Japan, two Pulitzer Prizes in nonfiction, the Nonino and Serono Prizes of Italy, and the Cosmos Prize of Japan. For his work in conservation, he has received National Geographic's Hubbard Medal, the Gold Medal of the Worldwide Fund for Nature, and the Audubon Medal of the Audubon Society. He is currently Honorary Curator in Entomology and University Research Professor Emeritus at Harvard University and Chairman of the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation and Chairman of the Half Earth Council. Welcome, Ed and Sally. Well, thanks, Provost, for that uh, uh, too long introduction of me, but never long enough for the, indu the introduction of Dr. Wilson with what he's done. Um, so, Dr. Wilson, I, I just think about uh, the nine decades that you have been examining the natural world, beginning most likely, as most of us do, by eating some dirt as a baby. Um, but I also think about the nine decades of human history and, and our evolution as a species that you've seen during that time, this seems like a little different time right now than what we have experienced. Is there something unique about our relationship as humans with the natural world at this time and this moment in history? And what can we learn from that? Please call me Ed. All right. <laughs> Uh, or, given my origin in Alabama, Ayud. 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 Okay, I got that down. <laughs> okay. Well, you came in with the toughest question of all, which is, what are we doing wrong? We can enumerate it, but I'd put it, as I think intuitively most sitting out here understand it already, not that our technological advances century after century have led up to where we can do in almost anything we want with the surface of the world anyway, regardless of the consequence. And we're learning the hard way, beginning with catastrophic, beginning changes of the climate, as uh, brilliantly explained by uh, Dr. Lockhart. Uh, and now, 
uh, to the elimination of a lot of the natural environment and the anim then animal plants and probably some microbes too that have taken uh, billions of years to evolve. And um, we're just, we're, we've arrived at a level and the huge population able to destroy the rest of the life on the planet at our will. And unfortunately, we haven't yet learned restraint. And so the role of scientists like us uh, who study the environment, and particularly the subject of biodiversity, it's up to us to state clearly the measurements of the amounts of biodiversity left on Earth, the necessity of good parts of it to keep the whole environment intact and healthy, healthful for us as the dominant species, and then to uh, proceed with some prudence. So when we met at one point, when I was Secretary of the Interior, you talked about an area that was very special to you as a child, which you would like to become the Mobile Tinsa Delta National Park. When you think about that place that shaped your childhood, what is it about it that is special? And how does that relate to the kind of areas that need to be protected when we think about half Earth? Um, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a seventh generation Mobilian. And when I was a boy riding across the uh, causeway of Mobile Bay on my bicycle, I visited the Mobile Sensor Delta called America's Amazon by some journalists frequently and explored parts of it uh, as a teenager. I grew up with it and by direct exposure with some of the richest parts of America's biodiversity inhabiting it, came to have a close feeling, a close relationship to it. Um, then later, as I looked over the situation across the nation after where Robert MacArthur and I had developed the theory of island biogeography, I recognized that um, we needed in, in biodiversity rich areas, California of course we've been emphasizing is another one, uh, that we needed to uh, nurture them uh, protect them and all of the uh, biodiversity within them because a little bit of disturbance in an area like that can do a lot of damage. Then I looked at the, uh, at the delta of the Mobile and Tensaw River. The great Alabama River system flows with a large part of its um, source uh, out of Georgia, diagonally across the state of Alabama and then down to empty in the Mobile Bay. And where it empties, it's created its first divides, comes down and then divides again to create two branches embracing of the delta for close to 100 miles, creating a natural area, almost subtropical in its climate with extraordinarily richness of fauna and flora. Uh, and it occurred to me that this was a logical place for a national park. There was not, correct me if you know me to be in error, there is no uh, national park for uh, the environment anywhere on the Gulf Coast, from Key West all the way around to the tip of, of Texas. None. Uh, and this is where, this is, for well, the Northern Hemisphere, this is one of the richest places in the world. Uh, and uh, therefore, I got busy with others in the Mobile area 
and uh, we sat getting all the information we needed to present to you, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Although, unfortunately, because of political events, uh, uh, we, didn't, we didn't have time to give it to you. But at any rate, uh, we, um, uh, with, the, with the committee in Mobile, uh, are prepared to take this delta, which is the second largest in North America, and turn that whole delta into a park uh, that contains uh, one of the largest number of bird species in North America, which contains uh, almost uh, well over 300 species of freshwater fish, and um, the largest number of crayfish and mollusks and snails, aquatic in nature. Uh, an immense array of amphibians, and I saved it for last, 32 species of snakes. <laughs> uh, Perfect. Of course, that appeals to me. <laughs> but at any rate, this is a biologically rich part of North America that deserves to be saved and made easily available for people from around the world to visit as, as they wish. Forgive the length of my speech. I think it's wonderful, and I, I think you've probably got some advocates out here that we might oh, yeah, not have right. had before. I, I think you saw me, in fact, <laughs> when I first had the offer to bring it up, that you thought that might not be a bad idea. I think it would be a great idea. Okay. So uh, I think some of the first material I read that you wrote was many decades ago, and it was all about ants. So I'm just curious what uh, we humans might be able to learn from ants as we think about how we shape a, a different future than the track that we're on. Yes. Um, almost nothing. <laughs> Uh, I have to tell you the truth about ants, which I've come to love because I just got the opportunity to study them when I was just a boy. Actually, when I was 13 years old, I was trying to find all the different species of ants that existed in Mobile. It was a scout project. And I found this mound of, um, of ants teeming with several hundred thousand stinging ants. <laughs> uh, and uh, to make a long story short, I uh, went on to discover that this was the imported fire ant, the first colony. Uh, it was uh, it or its progenitors were uh, brought up by accident on the shipping that comes in from South America uh, to Mobile. Uh, this ant was a serious pest, remains one, started to spread out of the city of Mobile, into the farmland, Florida, Mississippi, and quickly became a major pest of agriculture, of wildlife, and the fact uh, even of many agricultural crops. And with alarm, the Department of Agriculture uh, set out uh, to um, do the, uh, to maybe eliminate the menace with force majeure. I don't know if you remember uh, the, that decade in the 50s when we were um, thinking about the positive uses of atomic weapons. I was eating dirt in the 50s, but that's oh, yeah, okay. Let's, yeah. uh, iterate, that's uh, amazing. Uh, the uh, Atomic Energy Commission said, well, why don't we do something positive because it's uh, with this huge atomic well, uh, stockpile we have. One suggestion was to create another uh, harbor in Alaska. Another suggestion uh, was to cut the needed canal across, I don't know, whatever Central American country, country could be bullied into accepting. The idea would be to plant a row of low-yield atomic weapons across mm -hmm this country, it would be Panama or Nicaragua. Mm. And then, of course, with the agreement of the people. Yeah. At any rate, uh, so that at the, so the, uh, the given moment, the presidents of the two countries push a red button, and they would go boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and the waters 
of the Pacific would flow into the waters of the Caribbean. Yes, it was. It turns out that they're considerably higher. <laughs> <laughs> I was on, as a young member, I was on the uh, National Academy of Sciences uh, committee to in investigate the possible consequences of um, a, uh, of a not, uh, of a, another canal like that that doesn't have locks. Uh, and what we had to report killed that idea right there. Uh, but anyway, we were talking about um, American triumphalism. I think it would, that would be a good period. We were going to do great things uh, because we had the atomic power to do it. And um, at any rate, uh, this would include spraying the, the range of the imported fire ant that it had reached already across most of the southeastern United States. Spray it with pesticides. Great idea. Oh, and we just get rid of all the fire ants uh, in one shot, a moonshot. And we didn't think or remember uh, much of the uh, uh, progenitors of this idea, didn't think much about the possibility that it might kill off a large amount of the wildlife uh, and be a menace to human health too. But Rachel Carson did. Mm -hmm. And Rachel Carson had heard of me then as someone who had, <laughs> thank you, I mean, she's a great figure, uh, who I wish had lived longer than she did. Uh, at any rate, she had heard of me as an expert on fire ants. So I was at Harvard then, and she wrote me and said she'd like to come down. Uh, I didn't and talk with me about it and so on, because she was going to write a book. And um, I... Um, and she couldn't make it. She wrote me a little later that she'd grown ill. Uh, and then I did one of the worst things in my entire life. I failed to go to ride up to meet her. So I never met her personally. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did give her advice over the phone and mail. And I uh, helped her find the information she needed to know of what would happen if you eliminated a large number or fraction of the wildlife including insects, by any means, whatever. And I've been proud all my life since of being uh, noted by uh, her biographer mm -hmm. uh, that this was several years ago that I was still uh, one, only one of two people who worked directly with Rachel Carson. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of that. Mm -hmm. I also had a chance uh, to personally meet Bear Bryant of the Alabama Crimson Tide. Uh, but uh, I said to the dean who approached me and said, the bear is now in his office, and I'll introduce you to him uh, if you'd like. And uh, I said, sorry, I, I've got to catch a plane. <laughs> well, at any rate. Um, is that wondering. why they're not letting you back in the that state? Was, that was a long-winded. <laughs> Talk and I forgot what the question was. But that was about I, ants. No, that's I, good. I, I hope I gave you a sufficient. <laughs> Absolutely, you did. Okay. So when yeah, it's hard to picture this, uh, you know, concept of kind of blowing up a, a, a pathway between the Pacific and the Caribbean. Um, but when we think now about like what are the drivers of biodiversity loss, like you know the burning fires we see in the Amazon or the deforestation in Borneo. Um, so often those things are driven by human activities like uh, agriculture or extractive industries or infrastructure uh, that bisects and, and uh, impacts the connectivity of ecosystems, urbanization, and so on. How do you think we should be reshaping our policies and our practices to achieve much more sensible land protections? Where would you start? The presidents of our country and of Brazil are in agreement on one thing, which is vast forests that we own and other natural habitats should be uh, utilized, you know, harvested, whatever it takes, uh, to increase uh, the wealth of the citizenry, which means, of course, usually a small section of the wealthier people in the, in, among the citizenry. 
And uh, their reasoning uh, pits uh, the million-year-old heritage of both countries uh, against immediate, purely economically derived and reasoned uh, increase of wealth. And uh, it, it's a terrible distinction to make or lean uh, toward uh, the uh, more immediate wealth of people. In the case of Brazil, uh, the, the situation is this. I, I don't want to get long-winded about this, but it, I thought folks here might be interested in this. Um, what's happening is that um, more and more of, of the um, Amazon forest, one of the greatest in the world, one of the big three, as they're called, the Siberian, of which 60% has been cut over, uh, the uh, Canadian boreal forest, of which only 15% has been cut over, and the great Amazon, of which unfortunately 40% has now been cut over, and uh, the uh, government and financial interests, some of them, uh, in Brazil are hell-bent to increase that in order to get more immediate wealth. Um, Here's how, it, here's how it happens, and it's difficult to stop. First, the, um, a farmer or a cattle rancher goes to the Amazon, finds that the government has made it possible for them to acquire at a reasonably low price a substantial section of the Amazon forest. Then they go in and uh, they find that the very considerable uh, minerals, uh, nutrient minerals uh, and other nutrients of the forest are locked up in all these big trees, in the arborescent vegetation trees and, uh, and first story bushes. And so uh, they need to get it out so that they can make use of it. And the way you do that is you cut it. Cut it all and let it all fall. And you wait a year and it dries out. Now it can be burned, and when it burns, the ashes contain the nutrients that you've been trying to get uh, to the uh, rather barren soil and leaf litter that characterize tropical rainforest. And the nutrients then are added over the, uh, underneath the burned out. Uh, forest uh, remains. And for two or three years, uh, the farmer, for example, gets a fine yield. But then, uh, having used up the nutrients that have been put from the trees into the soil, uh, the production of the farmer's land drops precipitously. It has to go on to the next. That's what's happening in Brazil. And then when you add to that the fact that many of these fires spread into the drier portions of surrounding forests, uh, you have what amounts to an ecological tragedy. So, That's sobering. So how to stop it? Yeah. The use of common sense and a sufficient amount of vocal demonstrators When I, when I came here for my first, uh, uh, first uh, series of lectures 45 years ago, I actually had the experience of watching one of the last uh, University of California Berkeley demonstrations. This was against the war, I mean, against a lot of things. So I was stood and watched that. And I thought maybe this is a particularly talented and potent group, generally, uh, to, uh, you know, to make uh, those who love the environment and want to save us from a disaster uh, might do something. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't you know, be, have, have uh, the poor judgment as just a visitor, again, to make any such suggestion. <laughs> Well, I will say that I think there is a very significant role to be played by the agricultural sector. 
you know, by agribusinesses, which the Nature Conservancy is doing some work with on what crops to grow, how to put in effective rotations, how to work on soil health so that uh, carbon is sequestered in the soils. And you can provide an economic basis for farmers in the Amazon and elsewhere to have a healthy living without destroying the rainforest. Because I think, you know, if you don't align the economic interests with the environmental interests, we're not going to make progress. And I think that's, uh, you know, it's cer some, certainly something that we've woken up to. That's completely right. Yeah. Uh, I belong to a committee uh, that Harvard initiated the creation of, uh, along with Brazilian scientists and, and conservationists. Uh, and we have called for, and we're trying to develop to make reasonable in concept to achieve exactly what you just said. Uh, this is so typical of great political or uh, economic or, in this case, environmental problems. We really should treat it as a problem to be solved and then use the best science and technology we can uh, to solve that problem. And there are ways of managing forests, uh, uh, that uh, great tropical forests like this one, without destroying it and eliminating the the huge fauna and flora that's in it. Yeah. And we should use our best knowledge and, uh, and the expertise we have available uh, to go down and solve that as a problem. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, we, we honored the Dangermans earlier. They were uh, recognized uh, the kind of mapping tools that we now have through companies like ESRI and the, the sort of maps that uh, you know, we, we saw earlier that Half Earth is working on knowledge is power, and we have an opportunity to have much better knowledge and do thoughtful development in the right ways and in the right places and avoid those places that uh, are more critical. So if you no. think about half the Earth, which is, you know, it's, uh, it's something people can uh, visualize. Uh, it's easier to say than it is to do. Um, of course, all lands and waters aren't equally important, and we learned that from Walter a little bit earlier. How, where would you say we need to start? What parts of this planet are the most critical, and how do we go about building awareness and support for their protection? I think you've got uh, an indication, uh, I mean, the audience said, of a, uh, to a certain extent, from the, uh, the talk just given by Dr. Yates, who's working with uh, us. Well, he's guiding the effort, actually. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we have also uh, the support and the, uh, the good advice of the leading commercial uh, maker and, and scientific research of map making, uh, Jack Desjardins, uh, to develop te mapping techniques based on as complete a knowledge as we can get of the fauna and the flora, where the species are, the condition they're in, of the condition of the environment that they're growing in, and put all that together and map it in such a way as to uh, hit, first of all, or to enclose uh, the hot spot. These are those areas in which you have the largest number of generally overall endangered species. And then to piece together the area, in some cases that would be gerrymandering, the best areas, if I might use that word, in this a more This is a good place to gerrymander. Yeah, I think that's a, a good idea. In a way, yeah. uh, is to take these slivers and spots and so on and fit them together so that we get uh, the needed half, or approximate half, uh, that also has the maximum diversity of plant and animal species. Uh, so that's what we're doing as science. And that brings us actually to uh, what's uh, now arising as a, uh, the rebirth of an uh, old discipline uh, that has now uh, new strength and power, and that's taxonomy, uh, the, uh, uh, the discovery and mapping of, of species, uh, finding out where they are, what their relationship is, and then increasingly we begin to do the natural history of each one of those species. That goes back to Linnaeus. 
uh, in 1735, who set out to map, to read, name, discover, name, and map every species of organism on Earth. And he made a, something of a, a very bold and courageous beginning. Uh, and we've been working on it ever since. But with the rise of the many branches of modern biology, uh, that has received special strength from the technology that it brings. Uh, taxonomy, just a classification of organisms, has seemed to fade away into the past. Now we need to revive it. Uh, and this is what I call the Linnaean Renaissance. We have to resume uh, the exploration of the world uh, without going on too long, I hope. Uh, let me just point out, number one, that we estimate that there are about 10 million species of plants and animals uh, on the planet. These are what we call the, um, uh, the, the uh, high uh, the, uh, eukaryotic uh, organisms, the species of eukaryotic organisms, about 10 million. And um, of those, we have some knowledge, and we've named about 2 million. We are only 8, and we're only 20% uh, on the way to mapping the uh, plant and animal species and uh, other eukaryotic organisms uh, on this planet. It's almost that like we're living on a little known planet. And we now need to resume this in order to find out the best ways and do the most sophisticated mapping to get the most out of setting aside new reserves all around the world. So I would uh, like to see that come back. We need, if, and I'm happy to talk to our future scientists out there, uh, those going into biology who might be looking around for the best most productive and important thing to do. We need experts on organisms, uh, you select them, and then become the world authority on them, and then lead the effort to take that group, whatever you've chosen, scorpions, mayflies, uh, uh, marsupial mammals, snakes, or whatever it is, and set out which, to do what you can do to become the world authority on them and undertake among your activities uh, the uh, discovery and the naming of all the remaining previously untreated species uh, and set it ready uh, for uh, this great effort to save the whole in one uh, moonshot. Well, we, I'm going to ask you one more question, then we'll throw it open to uh, questions from the audience. Um, we have heard, and this kind of very much in the theme of what you just said, we've heard from many young people in no uncertain terms that we're leaving them with an environmental mess. Uh, led by, we are leave, leaving that generation with an environmental mess. Greta Thunberg being the most vocal and visible uh, at Climate Week just last week. but. Um, I know we need more biologists to do the work you described, but the science around climate change is abundantly clear, and yet there are many people, particularly in this country, that uh, are not convinced that it's real. We come in all shapes and sizes and skill sets. Beyond science, what skill sets can human beings bring to the table to accelerate our awareness of what's going on and our uh, inspiration to take action? That's the big question. Of, in, in two of minutes. Decade, isn't it? <laughs> well, you, 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 you say, uh, suggest one, you can say uh, uh, maybe a little flippant by saying people will become convinced when they have to wade to get to their summer home. Uh, and um, the signs of it were just going to keep getting uh, more and more frequent and worse and worse. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we can adapt to the changes 
according to the course they're taking uh, and develop uh, new crops, new industries, uh, new ways of life. And we haven't given that enough time, I mean, enough effort to think through uh, as how we can adapt to th those parts that are going to be inevitable. And uh, then, of course, uh, we've seen uh, you know, the, um, the moves clearly laid out of what kind of changes we can and must make uh, in cleaning out the atmosphere by the instruments, by the, our, our uh, vehicles, by uh, all of the ways in which we uh, 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 have inevitably uh, polluted the environment to make the global warming uh, more readily, more ready. Uh, I uh, am proud to be uh, here uh, with here at Calif in California, where I pioneered it, and 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 got to meet again uh, your ex governor who started all this here. Uh, California is a leader, and um, I think we uh, should become much more animated, determined, and hopeful about taking the big changes in our ways of life. Uh, they're going to put a stop to climate warming. But then, but then, you better be ready for crisis number two. And that's, I predict, uh, the shortage of fresh water. It's happening worldwide. We've got major migrations attempted in, up from the Sahel and North Africa into Europe. And it's a good part of the reason why we're getting floods of people coming up from Central America. Climate change uh, is changing or is reducing the capacity of uh, people in a large number of, uh, of the Earth's surface uh, to have the kind of uh, normal life based on agriculture and, and, and water-based industries uh, that they deserve to have. And, then, when we solve that problem, comes number three, <laughs> crisis number three. And that is the collapse of ecosystems through the mass extinction of species. We have now increased the um, extinction rate between 100 and 1,000 times over what it was before the coming of humanity. And the number of species are going to continue to go down or uh, uh, retreat into rarity enough. Uh, so that we're going to start seeing not just the destruction of the ecosystems of the world, which is occurring, say, in Brazil and Indonesia, resulting in the extinction of species, but it's going to become reciprocating. Uh, that as enough species are taken out, uh, then we're going to see the total caps of the ecosystems. Incidentally, uh, since I know I'm talking to a student, uh, a good part of which is student uh, audience here, on uh, those of you who are thinking about science, uh, if I haven't convinced you about uh, going on to become a world expert on a particular group of organisms to uh, take part in the exploration of the, uh, of the world of fauna and flora as a part of, uh, of keeping the Earth natural environment, whole and healthy, uh, let me suggest uh, something else. And that is, we need to build the science. We haven't really even got it started of ecosystems. We know that our ecosystems, which are really what we try to protect, not just single species, but ensembles of species that have come together and have uh, reached stability, sometimes over thousands or even in some places millions of years, because the right species coming together have formed ecosystems that equilibrate. And we don't know really how equilibration uh, comes about. 
We need an ecosystems science, and there is going to be one uh, created, should be, has to be in the immediate future. So since I'm in a preacher's mood, I will say to you, please consider, if you want to go into science, please consider uh, going into uh, the uh, coming uh, development of a new biological science, one of the next big things, which is ecosystems studies. Uh, we want to know how they are formed. MacArthur and I made a, some contribution on that and island biogeography. But then, as they form, uh, how do they grow and how do they change? What are the main principles? What happens to them as they are evolving? These ecosystems, this forest on its own, an island here, this lake on that peninsula there, and so on. And as they're evolving, the, their ecosystems, their coral reefs, their rainforest, um, what happens when certain species go extinct, which is what's happening all the time? Species C goes extinct, what's going to happen? E? There certainly be some different effect. What's going to happen with that? Uh, or when you get invasive species, which are occurring all the time, what happens when something like a gypsy moth or the imported fire ant arrives? What can we expect? How bad a problem is going to be creating? What action should we take? So it's a practical problem. OK, and then this is what I have actually was personally invited to address four different uh, con uh, con uh, conferences organized by business CEOs during the last year to speak to. They wanted to know how ecosystems equilibrate and, and form solid, well-functioning units, because they thought maybe uh, what nature has achieved might result in principles they could achieve. Well, I couldn't give much of an answer, because I mean, do we have the science? We need to make the science. In other words, after we've learned, we know it's in the ecosystems, after we know what the early stages of creating them are, after we've begun to figure out the complex system by which species by species interact, after that, then we can say, here is how ecosystems come to a maturity that can last for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. That's going to be one of the big things of coming biology in this century. Thank you. Wow. Provost Paul. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ed and Sally, for that really inspiring discussion. And thank you for laying out a whole agenda that somebody who's just at the beginning of thinking about what they might do in this world, how they could approach the systems that you've talked about. And uh, it's very inspiring. Throughout much of Half Earth Day, we have already collected questions. Um, and uh, meanwhile, you have already given us more questions from the audience just while this discussion has been going on. So we have a system here. If you have, I don't, we'll hope to get to as many of these as we can. If you have additional questions, you can take them from your index cards and give them to an usher who will be bringing them up to me, and I will bring them in turn to Sally, who will then ask them of Ed. So we've got a system going here. <laughs> While you're bringing those up, I just want to say that with my Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering, that um, anybody, no matter what your background, can have an impact on creating the kind of world that we want to see. Okay. Sure. Absolutely. Anybody. Yeah. And in fact, uh, while Rachel Carson was a biologist, it was her writing that inspired the world. Uh, Bill Ruckelshaus, first ever head of the EPA, was a lawyer uh, and one of my heroes. 
And for those of you that haven't done your history, the Environmental Protection Agency was created by the Republican administration under Richard Nixon, and it was Rachel Carson, really, that inspired that action that brought us the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and so much more, following on the footsteps of the great state of California and its leadership. So I didn't appreciate the role of lawyers uh, until I worked in government, and the role of people in public service that sign up for this, and the role of artists who capture the hearts. The heads are here, but yeah, you can clap for that. We need to clap for the artists and the communicators. It takes all of us. All right, so there are a lot of questions here, which means uh, we need to try and... You, yeah, why don't you just pick it and... and uh, I will pick one, it. and um, we've got about close to 20 minutes, so we'll see uh, right, okay. how many of these can get through. How do you expect climate change to impact the half-Earth half plan to preserve biodiversity? Uh, will saving habitat matter in the face of climate catastrophe? Um, yeah, it will, because uh, the climate changing uh, would have to be far more than even uh, the scariest uh, scenarios uh, allow, uh, and uh, we're not going to have, uh, I'll say, uh, coniferous boreal forests. We're not going to have major grasslands in Australia and so on uh, change radically uh, just by uh, climate change alone. Uh, climate change certainly can do a lot of damage. It's going to result in the extinction of species in most of those systems. And it's certainly going to cause us, as a species, grief. I think most people understand how that's going to happen. Uh, but I don't think, uh, just as a technical matter, and this is one of these things we need to study ecosystems in order to predict more confidently, I don't think that we're going to have climate change altering, at least not in the next few decades, uh, the major, more expansive uh, ecosystems and, and habitat types that are on the Earth today. That may, that may be too optimistic, but that's... We have to be optimistic. <laughs> All right, so um, you've studied ants. This may not be your area of expertise, but what is it about humans, our brains or our emotions, that has us unable to realize what we are doing to the Earth to cause it to be in peril and crisis? Well... Um, what do you mean? What about humans? You, you're asking why do humans? What well, is it about humans? Yes, why humans? Why are Why humans, don't we get it? What? Why don't we get it? I'm I'm interpreting this question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, why we remain so destructive? That's, is that it? Yeah. Um, I think it's because well, I've written extensively on this. And not everyone who's read the arguments I've made uh, would agree, although I've gotten more uh, professional scholarly agreement than I expected. And that is that the way we, uh, the re we evolved, primarily in Africa before the breakout, first of Homo erectus uh, and then of uh, Homo sapiens precursors, and with the Neanderthal precursor. Uh, the way we evolved, primarily in Africa, uh, involved um, a pretty aggressive interaction between tribes and also pretty severe uh, impact on the environment. And it resulted in success of our pre-human ancestors to the extent uh, that we tended to remain favorable toward uh, impulses of group competition and of clever and constantly expanding ex and uh, improving ways to convert the environment to our immediate needs of survival and reproduction. In other words, we evolved that way. We have instincts. 
So there's uh, another question here about indigenous communities, and there's still a sub substantial part of our earth that is stewarded by its original inhabitants who seem to have done a better job than uh, the rest of us in terms of living in harmony with nature. What can we learn from those communities and how might they be allies in uh, creating the kind of um, yeah. biodiversity that we need? First, certainly indigenous peoples come up as, a, as an early concern over the half earth uh, strategy of saving biodiversity. Um, and I don't see that as a fatal problem. In fact, I see it the other way. Because where the richest environments are, both coastal marine areas and uh, rainforest and uh, productive savannas and the like, the people who have uh, lived there, in many cases, for thousands of years, the tropical rainforest areas have been occupied for into the tens of thousands of years, for example. Uh, the people have adapted, uh, created uh, lasting means of, of living in those environments, uh, to come to depend upon the stability and yield, continuing yield from those environments. And I don't, uh, I doubt if we'll uh, ever see any uh, reason to want to move them out of there. Quite the opposite. They're part of the ecosystems that are there. So I'm not too, if that's the import of that question. I think I the, think. yeah, the implication was they're doing a good job. How do we support their? They're already doing a good their, job. Why should yeah. we consider them as part of the, uh, of, uh, of the problem? They're yeah. part of the solution. I think yeah. it's, it's very clear. Right. Yeah. Um, OK, a half-Earth question. How much progress has been made so far uh, on the half-Earth project, and what obstacles get in the way? The um, progress that has been made most conspicuously uh, has been through national parks and reserve areas created by countries. Yeah. Uh, and right um, during uh, the visit, here by me, my colleagues, some of my friends. Uh, we have been hearing more and more, and I hope that you, uh, you know, listening, uh, will look into this yourself uh, as a premier example of the right way to go. And that is, in Mozambique, uh, a country that was torn when it finally liberated itself from Portugal, and then had from uh, 1979, 1992, a horribly destructive civil war. Uh, the natural environments were badly damaged, and the park, the national park, at Goran Goza, south central Mozambique, uh, was devastated. I mean, virtually all the Larger animals were killed for meat, and uh, the uh, park was badly damaged. Uh, but um, uh, it is now fully restored, and then being fully restored has begun to bring uh, more and more people into the country uh, as tourists, in terms also of helping build up businesses, uh, and also, it's resulted in dramatic uh, increase in educational opportunities of the people in and around the Gorongosa Park, and a uh, better standard of living, and um, a uh, national pride that grows every year uh, for that. Mozambique is a very livable country now. Uh, be, and uh, growing rapidly uh, econo in economic and political and, and, and social evolution uh, because of the park system. Okay, I just got a whole bunch back of new questions. Um, 
with, without any more time. The time didn't come with the questions. All right. Well, well give them to me when we finish. Right. I'll write another book. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're working on that anyway. <laughs> How do we incorporate connectivity in the Half Earth vision and project? Play again. How do we incorporate connectivity? Oh, yes. This is a. a when you uh, have a lot of natural areas or, or small parks already made of the kind that you must need to save uh, the faunas and floras, um, in many cases, you have an opportunity uh, to connect them. For a long time in the studies of ecology and projection, in theory on biogeography, there was a dispute which says, oh, you don't want to connect them. One side said, well, you don't want to connect them because if you did, then you're going to have a destructive species that's just being managed by this one, going over and devastating that one and so on. Well, it turns out, though, that the evidence is the other way. If you can have a corridor that allows a pretty good flow back and forth, plants and animals, uh, that uh, it improves the stability of both of the smaller reserves to the extent <clears throat> that you can almost consider them a single park. So that is a very important step forward. And there is, in fact, a bill before Congress right now to take all those federally owned areas uh, that uh, are not crucial for some other function uh, that uh, connect or could be extended a bit to connect the smaller parks in, North, in the United States uh, to do so and increase then the, uh, the amount of conservation potential for all the plant, plants and animals in both of these uh, parks. Uh, and so that is what is happening at the present time. Uh, is uh, there's more and more research going on. Uh, there are books appearing uh, showing the best way to do this. And uh, I hope that the bill in Congress will pass to uh, accelerate that. Great. OK, I'm now in the process of bundling questions because I've got too many. Um, but there's several here on the theme of um, how we engage young people, how we inspire young people, uh, how do we work with them? And they range from how do you introduce the concepts of half earth into the fourth grade curriculum? Uh, how do you inspire uh, people, especially young people, to save the planet? And uh, there's a powerful youth voice that has a lot of knowledge and ideas. How will you work with them? Uh, young people or just people generally? Young people. Okay. I shouldn't have to work with you. You see that. You can see in it a great future for yourself. Uh, for you going into uh, science, general science, you have an area of uh, inquiry added uh, in which you can do uh, highly productive original research. And for everybody else, uh, what you will have as a result of following half-earth procedures, enlarging park, making cards, or connecting them with parks, uh, protecting the plant and animals in them as a matter of course, uh, utilizing uh, creative uh, geography. All these things uh, should be attractive uh, to you, uh, those, to those of us, uh, to those of you who are looking for areas where they can be part of a growing and, and very productive science, uh, and for everyone, uh, for um, a better quality of life. Great. So I don't think any arguments I make, well, I just made it. <laughs> That's my argument. Well, it's kind of related here. Thank you for the advice for young scientists like myself. Can we save the natural world within the structure of capitalism? And if so, what are the best strategies to do so? Did you use the word destructive? No. <laughs> it's a, can you save the world? Uh, 
within the structure of capitalism? Can you save the natural world within the structure of capitalism? Uh, oh, I see. Is there any way that we can constrain and uh, promote capitalism uh, that will uh, align with the interests the, of the natural increase world? Increase protection yeah. of natural yeah. environments. Um, the conferences, there were three of them uh, that I went to and contributed to in the last year had this, uh, they had this as, a, as, a, uh, as an opening assumption that not only could they learn, they thought, and they hoped, and I think they're right, uh, principles of uh, compatibility of operations within the organization as within an ecosystem uh, based on principles that are not yet fully clear, but they're there, they believe, I believe. Uh, but also uh, that um, it, uh, they have discovered, and it's now pretty uh, solidly established, that companies that are green, uh, including especially companies that are making products and are in affecting the environment, uh, in those cases that where what they are doing improves the environment by one means or other, by the products they make, uh, by uh, the uh, measures they take uh, to actually uh, improve the quality of the environment uh, as public as the policy of the uh, corporation. Uh, in the case of um, uh, marketing, have consistently, oh, and, and giving more power to uh, the stakeholders. Taking a little bit away, they talked about, they've, at these conferences, they've talked away about taking a, something away from shareholders and give it to the stakeholders, the, uh, the employees, uh, the people who own the land that they have, uh, they, they use, and so on. Uh, in all cases studied for any length, it turns out that when you do that, when you develop an amity with your potential customers and with the people especially living in the area, your profits go up. You might think that it was going to be the opposite. You know, we're going to sacrifice some of our productivity or some, or some of our uh, profit by uh, doing the right thing. You thought maybe it's, going to, it's a price you had to pay, but in fact, it's consistently the opposite. Well, I want to add to your answer, if I may, by sure. saying that uh, I have seen as a, a government official and as a business person most of my life that when you align the interests of business with the interests of the environment, uh, things move. And I'll use an example, and this is actually one that even uses the Nature Conservancy, my current employer. Um, with the help of the state of California, and the federal government, and local uh, entities, and the Nature Conservancy, and using ESRI's incredible products and mapping tools, California said, we need renewable energy. We mapped out the Mojave Desert in California. Incredibly rich biodiversity, including uh, critical habitat now, and if species are brought back. Um, we identified areas that made sense for renewable energy and areas that should never be developed. And then we said, we meaning Department of Interior and BLM specifically, if you develop in those areas, we, will, we have done the environmental work, you'll have your permit within 90 days. So market created by State of California renewable energy requirements, um, purchase power supply contracts created because of that, pre-clearing the environmental and all the other conflicts by driving the development to the area that was not in conflict, and all of a sudden you have uh, renewable energy plans in California that are off to the races. Mm. So I don't think, uh, we haven't yet figured out how to move away from capitalism, but the answer I think is how you harness it in service to the planet, instead of harnessing it in a way that destroys the planet. and. Uh, I've seen it happen. Right. Um, this is a question about uh, 
how does Half Earth communicate with other countries? And what other international and national agencies, uh, what, what can they learn from this communication? How do you get the whole planet on board, in other words? Well, the, uh, the Half Earth idea, starting with its first consideration at the uh, uh, 2016 uh, conference uh, run by the International Union for Conservation of Nature in Honolulu. Uh, the, uh, the idea has swept the conservation world. Uh, uh, it's simply accepted, as far as I can see, by virtually every conservation organization as a good idea to try out, to develop. And uh, I, I believe that we've, we've had enough setbacks, we've had enough heartbreaks uh, to want to uh, try something else. And it has the right sound to it, too. I mean, uh, if we uh, don't have to be constantly checking and holding the, taking the pulse of every possibly endangered species and so on in order to keep the whole operation productive, we want to get past that. We'd like to get uh, a remedy that, once applied, consistently shows that it has the result uh, hoped for. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that uh, it has been successful. It's, been, it's continuing to be successful now. Great. So climate change and um, biodiversity loss and so on do not impact all portions of the population equally. Um, so what's the best course of action to help those currently affected and most devastated by climate change in developing countries? Repeat that, please. I'm not sure. I'm sorry to Yeah, I think that, no, that. the question basically is, um, let me just rephrase it in my own words. Some of the people least able to influence policy are the ones most affected oh. by the policies that have created climate change. How do we help those in developing countries, help those who've got the least means available to help themselves? Uh, well, as the Mozambique or the Gorongosa example shows, uh, usually, I believe, uh, that it's going to prove uh, by what's already shown uh, that uh, when done intelligently, uh, it can actually um, improve the income, uh, the stability of the environment, reducing cost, uh, higher cost, uh, necessitated by um, the ordinary uh, utilization of local labor and, and, and modification of, of the environment. Uh, that example, I think, is going to prove to be uh, very common, if not universal. I think that should, we should just continue to try it out, mm -hmm. to, uh, to find out. It's going to be a bit experimental. I'm confident that this is that half earth and reserves and integrating uh, the welfare of local people. In these areas, too, that are being set aside, there, I think, as, as the question indicates, or, or implies uh, they're going to be uh, already rather poor with few opportunities. And the, uh, again, the Corangosa uh, example shows that it can change that radically. Great. I would say that one of the interesting examples that we have within the Nature Conservancy right now is around sustainable fisheries. And if you look at some of these specific island nations that are impacted by unsustainable fisheries and by uh, climate change and, and sea level rise, um, they are coming on board in a significant way, recognizing that if they protect the apex species and uh, uh, keep track of their catch and have a sustainable fishery, they'll have uh, jobs for life. And they, and, exactly. Uh, There's a mutual, mutual interest. benefit. Oh, I want to tell you an example. My, one of my favorite examples from life at uh, Gorongosa when I was, was there. Uh, there was a, um, a woman who 
managed our laundry. And um, she uh, was so good and so dependable and, uh, and uh, uh, just such a good employee of the start. Uh, that uh, Greg Carr, who runs the park, uh, put her in charge of all the laundry uh, operations in Gorongosa Park. And she had an increase, substantial increase in salary, so the first thing she did was to go out and buy a second husband. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> Before you jump in, Paul, to wrap this up, I just I have one question I'm going to a answer, which is, what advice would you have for scientists interested in public policy careers? And I will say that we are losing incredible scientists in public policy careers, and we need to replace them soon. And the application process, at least for the federal government, takes a while, so you can go ahead and put your application in now. <laughs> and may maybe it will be a little easier environment in the future, but there is nothing I have done that's more valuable uh, or has more impact than serving in uh, public service. So I encourage scientists, if that is your inclination, to go for it. Thanks. Paul. So that was really... Thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you both for this conversation. It has really been quite wonderful. Um, Ed, perhaps you have a closing remark for our community? Is there something you'd like to share as a final parting remark on your ideas for Half Earth Day and what people here should be thinking about? Closing comments. Well, you know, I've got my hearing aids on, but I didn't quite get that. If you did, repeat it for me, please. Yes, he says, do you have any parting words of wisdom for the audience about Half Earth and uh, uh, inspirational words to leave all of us with? Okay. I think, um, I'm not sure if they're words of wisdom, but I would say that uh, the success of the Half Earth proposal, which was based on pure science, of the relationship of area and species diversity uh, should encourage you, those of you who are coming into science and want to be creative uh, in some, well, as a branch of science. And this branch of science is wide open for work at every level. Uh, should recognize that um, innovations like this uh, can have uh, they can have a dramatic positive result, and they will be part of the biological sciences uh, in, um, in saving uh, the biodiversity and conservation, uh, and probably other uh, important uh, uh, procedures, policies, and techniques for the improvement of uh, society generally. So I'll just add that to your very good advice about considering uh, government service uh, to go into science with the confidence that uh, there are fields, and ecology is one of them, and ecosystem studies within it and so on, uh, that are wide open uh, for big advances uh, in uh, understanding new experiments, ideas, and applications. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Ed. Let's each go out and do our part to try to make Half Earth real. Good evening. <laughs>